All right, good morning, Uplift Church. Worship was absolutely awesome this morning, and I know that Super Day prays over a lot of this stuff, and just sometimes it just really connects, and you just, uh, I don't know, you just feel like you just experience the, the presence of God, and I think sometimes we feel that way more so than others, that we feel like we uh, are closer to God than, than other times, or we may feel like that we're, I don't know, has anybody ever given you a pat on the back and said, like, hey, man, you did, you did a good job? Has anybody ever told you that? And almost you're like, ah, oh, you know, I did. And there's sometimes you get a pat on the back and you've not done a good job. And then you, you kind of feel a little bad uh, about those times. And I think that what's so neat about the Sermon on the Mount is, is that um, Jesus was given the people who thought they deserved a pat on the back. He was, you know, rebuking them and the people that thought they could nowhere near obtain it. He was trying to. He's trying to kind of build, build them up. And see, uh, being, uh, I've always looked up to my dad. And I remember my aunt asking me, this is my dad's sister, hey, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I don't care. I just want to be taller than my dad. And uh, I am about like half an inch. And uh, it doesn't matter. I wanted him to look up uh, to me because I looked up so much to him. And uh, every time that he would uh, go through life, and every time that, you know, he would set the bar, uh, and that's, I've got this bar set up here, so Dad, you know, he would have this guide, you know, hey, do this, and Dad, you know, he would, he would set the bar, and you'd, you'd reach that. He'd be, okay, that, that's great, you, you did good, you did exactly what I asked. Now, let's try it, let's try it this way, and then this way. And then I was like, Dad, you keep raising the bar. Like, it, like, I, it's unobtainable, you just, you just keep raising the bar what we're supposed to achieve and what he was trying to teach me was was this is that if we will never set our goals high then we will always fall short does that make sense if we never set our goals high we'll always fall short some friends of ours they said that the, they always set the bar high for their kids so even if they fall short they're still going to be up high and sometimes we look at the bible and we think man god he set this bar up so high we, we can't live it. I mean, how many times has somebody told you that, that, that they just they can't live it? They, they, should, they know they should go to church. They know they ought to be saved, but they just can't live it. Now, so many people have told me that. And this is what Jesus was kind of trying to address through the Sermon on the Mount was so much of this, this attitude of people who had self righteousness like, oh, I ain't killed nobody. We're, you know, I'm, I'm all right. And then Jesus, he was correcting them. And so... Wonder what with us today, what is our bar? What what is our goal? What is our lifestyle? What what is our bar? What are we, what is it that we're trying to, to seek? What is it that we're trying to obtain? Now I think in the end we all want to hear those words at the very end, well done, good and faithful servant. We I think we want to hear hear those words. But it's not going to happen just by chance, you know. I think that what we need, we need a word from God. A fresh word from God. That we can live close with Him each and every single day. I want to please the Father. And I think that you do too. And what problem was is that here it, that Jesus is addressing these people with the Sermon on the Mount is that they were kind of had a misrepresentation of what Jesus' purpose was. They were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the King. But what they were looking for was a, a Savior. Not necessarily from their self or from their sins. They are looking for a Savior from being under a different rule. They wanted their land back. They wanted their country back. And so they were looking for this big king, this big ruler. And that's not what they got. Jesus even addressed this. And you can look this up later. But he said it in Luke 19.10. He said, for the Son of Man, talk about himself. His mission, Jesus' mission statement was to seek and save that which was lost. That was it. That was his mission statement. And so he spent his time seeking after this and, and fulfilling this. But it was not necessarily what they we're looking for and then on the sermon on the mount he really kind of set things in perspective when we learned last week that hey god is great we're not and that we need to kind of change our attitude here and through this we can really get filled up with god as we empty ourselves out for others and he builds on from that and he goes on until how we are the light and if you have your bible look at matthew chapter five and uh, again this is the same chapter we were in last week but he goes on to different a different part. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And they had this wrong idea about what he was there for, what, what his purpose was, what he was trying to fulfill. And sometimes we come to church trying to almost, with the same attitude, 
why are we here? What are we going for? You know, I think a lot of times kids, you know, sometimes the kids get drugged to church or dragged, however you want to word it. And, but for us as adults, sometimes we almost get it out of the way or put it in the checkbox. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus addressed these people and he said in verse 17, Don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Jesus wasn't doing away with the law. He was saying, I've come to fulfill it. The law is there. The law is forever to stand. It's there. And see, the Old Testament was pretty much setting the bar for us and then us realizing that, hey, well, we couldn't necessarily really reach it. And this is why we needed a Savior. We needed Jesus, somebody that could help us get to this point. So he was saying that this law, it's not going away. The Old Testament let us know that we were sinners. The New Testament let us know how God had a plan for it. But the problem was is that there are some righteous people that went, hey, guys, look at us. We set the bar right here. Most of them were called the scribes and the Pharisees. Said, hey, guys, look at us. We're, we're li- we are the epitome. We are the living example. You want to know how to get close to God? Watch me. Watch the way we live. And so they were the epitome of it. And they followed what they had, these laws. They followed it down to the, I mean, to the letter. But the problem was that they missed some things. And here's what Jesus starts addressing in the rest of this message, in the rest of this sermon, his Sermon on the Mount. Verse 20, he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's kind of putting this bluntly to them. He's like, guys, you're going to have to exceed. The scribes and Pharisees, they may have set this bar right here, but unless you exceed this, you're not going to go in. So he really grabbed their attention. I mean, how, how much would it take for God to get your attention whenever you think that you're headed in the right direction? You think, it's like, whoa, whoa, no. You're not. Think of it this way. Whenever you are driving down the road and you see blue lights flashing, does that get, grab your attention? Sometimes it's behind you and other times it's in, when it's in front of you, you have a sigh of relief like, okay, they're not after me. And I don't know why it is, but whenever they're behind me, I always think they're after me. You're, maybe I know we're all law-abiding citizens, but sometimes 62 is so close to 55, it just feels right. It's wrong. It's wrong. And so what Jesus, he's calling them out. He's getting their attention here. He says, listen, unless you exceed this, you're not going to enter it in. Exceed this. Exceed these expectations that they had set in stone for themselves. Exceed it. Now, I don't know about you, but that grabs my attention. That grabs my attention. Jesus has already set the blue lights on. He's grabbed their attention. So he starts addressing these issues. And there's different categories. And the first one he addresses is murder. And you, sometimes if you're not careful, you'll go ahead and you'll just like, murder? I've not killed nobody. I've got this one whipped. Well, Jesus addressed this in verse 21. He said, you have heard it said uh, to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, I love this, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment, and whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says moron, you'll be subject to hellfire. Looking around, we've probably not committed any murder up to this point in our life. But you've heard the statement, if looks could kill. Now, that's what Jesus is talking about here. See what they're talking about? Hey, we've not killed anybody. We've not brought any of this murder on. We've not had any of this bloodshed from righteous anger. But Jesus is says, yeah, that's what you've heard, but I say, but, but I say. What Jesus is doing here is that he's raising the bar. He says, but I tell you, everyone who is angry, he is comparing murder and anger. This type of anger that even if you're so angry to the point, and there's so many older expressions, and I've never seen anybody so angry they could spit nails. Have you ever heard that? Like, I don't know who came up with that, but I think I could use a better analogy. So angry you could spit nails. Have you ever been that angry, that upset? And what Jesus is comparing that to is the same thing you've already committed murder in your heart. You're there. So when Jesus says this, he says, but I say, and I'm going to have to use a step stool because I've got short people problems. So what Jesus is saying here is that, yeah, you guys are living down here, but what I'm talking about 
is. But I say, you've heard it said, but what I say is, boom, he just set the bar way up here. So this anger now, we've got we to deal with our anger issues. Jesus just raised it up. See, they thought they were doing okay just because they physically didn't go out and kill nobody. And don't get me wrong, that's, a, that's an amazing feat. It, it, it's commendable. But Jesus is saying, nah, even our anger. He wasn't coming to do away with the law. He was fulfilling it. And he was trying to bring everybody's attention back to the heart. The problem was not the murder. The problem was the motivation behind the murder, and that was the anger. This righteous anger that they had. And it's what he's comparing it to. This, this murder. He said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. And he goes on to another subject. And this is dealing with sexual morality. Verse 27, he says, You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with his heart. And you've heard it said. You know, the bar was down here. You've heard it said, Jesus said, but I say. He's going to fulfill the law. And he wasn't trying to change it. He wasn't changing anything. But he was getting to the heart of the problem, which was their hearts, their attitudes. We can look around, oh, I never committed adultery or any type of sexual sin, all that. But Jesus said, hey, have you lusted somebody? Because if you have, then you've done it. So this is not bring new light to them. And it was really bringing a new light to them. I mean, it's a lot to us, but it's a lot to them. That, hey, we need to watch out. Even what our eyes see. What we're lusting after. Because what Jesus is comparing it to is that physically doing it. Physically engaged. And church, this is so difficult right now because so much of our culture is engaged by some sort of sexual activity or sexual pleasure. It's in images. It's in advertising. It's all around us. We can't help but see it. And so Jesus is addressing this issue that, hey, man. Even if you lust, even if you lust, Jesus is raising that bar. Raising that bar. Because see, sometimes we get a pat on the back thinking, oh, we're doing so good. Murder, I haven't killed nobody. Well, now it's compared enough to anger. And I, I've never, you know, committed any type of sexual sin, but then we got this lust here. How does this bring a new light into us? Jesus is getting to the heart of the problem. And it's our hearts, our attitudes. And sometimes we can have a bad attitude, as Tony already introduced us to this morning. Our attitudes. He addresses another section. And this is talking about with divorce. It starts with verse 31. He says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, Everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual morality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, I thought that we need to spend some time here uh, because this is a, uh, a complicated subject, but you need to understand the culture in which Jesus was addressing in this time. Uh, there was two dominant cultures, and it was the Greeks and the Romans. You had the Jews that were living in amongst all of this. And what they did is they had a very different idea about marriage. A very different idea. And I really want you to pay attention to this today because sometimes I think we have a different idea about marriage in our culture. I've heard people say that oh, all it is is just a piece of paper. It's not. Jesus addresses that here because what they had was a different idea about marriage altogether. See, for the Greeks, what, what they did in Greece, we saw an entire social system that was based on relationships outside the marriage. So what they did is that they would, they'd be married, but they would keep their, their spouse, they'd keep their wife at home while they found uh, their sexual drive, that stuff met outside of the marriage. And it was okay. It was, it was like that was okay. Like you kept your wife secluded at home while you could go out and find pleasure elsewhere. And it was socially accepted. What ended up happening was that they, people that they were sexually connected with outside the marriage, they ended up having a relationship with them and kind of liking them and loving them. And then what they would do is they would divorce their spouses. But they could do it or they practice it without any type of legal practice. They would just pretty much write her off. That's probably the simplest way that I can express that. They would just write her off. So they would go and they would marry and they'd find somebody else and they'd marry and they'd find somebody else. It didn't really require a legal 
a legal process. Now in Rome, divorce came just as common as marriage. We see that even Jesus had a conversation with this woman at the well that she had been married, you know, five times. Now I've always had this idea that it was probably her fault, but after doing research on the way that Romans viewed marriage, I'm not so sure. Because see, theirs was probably even, even, even sadder. This is, I, I'm going to read you this excerpt from this Roman orator, okay? This is, uh, his name was Meticulous. Matillus Nimicodus. It's a very difficult name to say, but he made this speech and he said this. If Romans were possible to love without life, to love without wives, we would be free from trouble. But since it is the law of nature that we can neither live pleasantly with them nor at all without them, we must take thought for the continuance of race rather than for our own brief pleasure. They were looking at marriage not to have a relationship, not for commitment, not for relationally, but for survival of their own existence. Does, just let that sink in for a minute about how sad that is. The only reason they were getting married was so they could procreate and have kids so that their human race could continue on. So you'd get divorced. And divorce. I mean, marriage to them, it became nothing more than a necessity. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that, breaks, that breaks my heart. I mean, I think much more of my wife than a piece of paper, and I think much more of her than some sort of object. I mean, don't get me wrong, she's blessed me with four amazing girls, and I think we've done our part to help populate the world. But that's not her only reason for being here. So Jesus had to address this issue. And the issue, it wasn't the divorce. The issue was the way they viewed marriage. And I don't know the way you view marriage. But the way that Jesus views it is that it is a commitment. Marriage is more than a piece of paper. It is a covenant between a husband and a wife. A covenant between a man and a woman in which you say, I do. Marriage is not to be entered into lightly, but with very much thought and, and prayer. With the idea, the conception that this is my mate. It's more than just an infatuation. It's more than just lust. It's a journey. A lifetime journey. So it's not one that we can enter into lightly. Not one that we should enter into lightly. So the problem was not the divorce. The problem that Jesus was addressing here was her attitude of marriage. More than a piece of paper. More than a contract. Not something you could just get out of easily. Because Jesus, we see his support of marriage when he performed this amazing miracle when he turned water into wine and he did so. It's like his, when he first went public, he turned water into wine at this wedding ceremony. Genesis tells us that, that the husband and wife, they must leave and cleave. They, they leave and they cleave. And the reason why this is here is so that we can understand the importance and the covenant of this, of this commitment. So Jesus was not addressing necessarily the divorce. It was their lightliness that they were taking of marriage. So I'm going to speak to all you kids here for a moment. And I don't know your view of marriage or what example that you've had before you. But I want you to understand that the whole process of dating, the whole process of finding someone is not to just to find someone that is attractive or that may be lustful or may be pleasant to look at, but to find someone that you can spend an eternity with. We don't take it lightly. Winter into it, patiently, prayerfully, thoughtfully. We could find someone that we could wake up to every morning. It doesn't say, Jesus doesn't get into the dress of how all the other issues of marriage because, yes, yeah, sometimes you want to choke each other. And sometimes you wake up and you don't get a kiss because it's dragon breath that greets you. But it's all good. It's all good. Jesus is saying it's a marriage covenant. I really want to spend some time because Jesus' focus, even though it appears to be on divorce, it's actually on the opposite of the commitment of the marriage. And I hope you understand that. And if you have questions about that, then I would love to speak to you about it further. The main point here is that the, the attitude that these Greeks and these Romans that they had on marriage and how lightly they took it and how easy it was for them to get out of it. 
how easy it was for them to get out of it. All you had to have was a couple of witnesses and sign a piece of paper and write her off. That was it. We don't keep our spouses away privately in our home. I hope you have a different idea about what marriage is about. Jesus goes on. And he keeps arresting. He's, and it's almost like that he's on a roll. He, he's on a roll because every time he says, you've heard it said, you've heard it practiced, but I say. But I say. And Jesus keeps raising that bar on all these different subjects. And he's addressing these different subjects during this culture. And I love this next section. Uh, <laughs> and I titled this, Tell the Truth. Tell the truth. Verse 33, he says this. Again, I love this. Again, you have heard it said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath. You must keep your oath to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, because it is God's throne. Now, this one is really difficult because it is so easy now to break so many promises. We can break promises and we can do this so easily. Even if you have a binding contract, you can get a good lawyer and get out of that binding contract. You can get out. You can break that promise. You can break that covenant that you make. You can break it. And what Jesus is saying here, I love what he said here. He's like, guess we're going to tell the truth. And he sums this up. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, he sums this up with verse 37. He says, but let your word, yes, be yes, and no, be no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. Hey, if you say you're going to do something, you do it. Yes, yes, no, no. My kids, when they were little, they loved to play this game where yes would mean no, and no would mean yes. And what they were trying to do was to confuse me and Amanda about what we'd agree to. Hey, can I have a snack? No, you cannot have a snack. You said no. Today, no means yes, so I can have a snack. And I, no, no, that's not at all what we're saying here. And sometimes I think we try to justify and do the same thing in our life. Like, I know this is no, but it looks right and it feels good. And like, I believe that this is a yes. I think this is a yes. She's like, no, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Church, I think this comes with so many things about what, even what we bring discipline into our lives. If we say we're going to do something, let's do it. So many times we'll agree to do something, and then as it gets closer, the date gets closer, we almost start backtracking. Like, oh man, I wish I hadn't committed to that. They're going to feel so bad. Maybe I could lie about it and say the kids are sick or, or something. I'm just not feeling good. Oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not feeling so hot right now. Yeah, I, I, that's what we'll do when we'll get out of it. He's like, no. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. This is probably one of the most important things my dad ever taught me. You ask him a question one time, you never ask him again. If he said yes, that meant yes. If he said no, that meant no. And that's carried on even now to what we do with my kids. Church, you couldn't put it any simpler. Tell the truth. You can put this in all areas of your life. All areas of your life because lying is not going to help anybody. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. You, when it comes to like discipline in your life, whether it be uh, going on the diet or physical or uh, any type of work. Hey, you say you're going to do something, you do it. You say, hey, I'm going to say no to cake, we say no to cake. If we say, hey, I'm going to say yes to this area of my life, then we say yes. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. One of the most important parts of, this life, of your life that you could apply this to is the discipline with your kids. Because sometimes kids come with those big, watery, in my family, blue eyes. Yours may be brown or green, but they come to you. And they're just like, but daddy, and they tilt that head a little. And you see the water-filled eyes coming. And there's a small soft spot in here, and you go, oh. And you just, you're battling this now. You're like, oh man, I really want to say yes. You're like, yeah. Go ahead. But what ends up happening is, is that, oh, now they're playing the daddy sweet card. And now they know what they can do next time. And next time when you stick to the no, they're like, well, what happened last time? You said no, but then you ended up saying yes. And then you're having to swallow your pride. Like, yep, you're right. So now you're going to have to stick to your guns. And which one are you going to do? Are you going to cave in again or are you going to say yes? Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Let your yes be yes. And your no be no. Even in discipline when it comes to your kids. Church, I'm telling you, this one is one of the most important you can apply to any, any area of your life. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. 
Are you committed to your spouse? Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Are you committed to your job? Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Are you committed to your relationship with God? Are you committed to school? Are you committed to this basketball team? Are you committed? Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. He goes on, he continues on. And this next one, he says in verse 38, he said, again, you have heard it, you've heard that it was said. So he's initializing what the bar here is. And he's not doing away with it. He's not doing away and say, this is not right. But he's getting back to the heart of the problem. He says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. You know, I was reading this and I'm studying this and I'm like, what? Because if somebody comes up and they're going to jack slap you on the cheek, I doubt any of us are going to say, what about this side? But what he was getting at is going above and beyond. He was going above and beyond because sometimes people will take advantage of us. He was telling them to go the extra distance. What their law was doing here, what their law was saying is that the law was required for you to go so far, but what Jesus is trying to get them to understand here is that go even further. Go even further. So if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. They want your shirt, give them your coat as well. And he's given this, and he keeps raising the bar and raising the bar. And it, as he's raising this bar up, and I can see it in my own life, like, wait a minute, it, he's getting to a point here. He's getting, to, he's getting to this point because what he's addressing here is not the law, it's their hearts. That was the problem. Their attitude, the way they're treating each other, their attitude about marriage, their attitude as they're going through life, yes, but yes, no, we can lie, we can break contracts, we can get out of it. You've heard it say this way. He wasn't trying to do away with it, but he was trying to bring a better understanding of what the law was meant. Jesus was raising the bar, and as he was raising this bar, the bar set so high, and I could just imagine at this point in his message, these really got their attention. Because I think some of them had this attitude like, oh man, we, we were doing so good. We were doing so good. I, I thought we were doing so good. Jim, I thought we were doing so good. But Jesus come here and he's just done away with it all. He's raised the bar up so high, I don't think that I can obtain it. But then he keeps on going. I like this next part. In verse 43, he says this. You have heard it, that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. See, this kind of goes hand in hand with what we heard of last week. Love your enemies. Pray for them. When's the last time you've prayed for one of your enemies? Prayed for somebody that's done you wrong? Prayed for somebody who maybe they gave you the short end of the stick? Prayed for someone who you feel like don't deserve your time, your attention, or your prayers. And church, what Jesus is getting here is to the heart of this problem. This heart of all of this teaching, all of this teaching revolves around this one word, this one topic. All of this. We talked about murder and adultery and divorce and oath and going further and praying for your enemies. And all this comes down to this one simple word. Love. Love. Your love for one another. Love. We kind of hold love back in reserve for you know key people or for uh, our our spouses or for you know our family or for our kids. But what Jesus is teaching here is that no, it's not that you're having a problem following this law. It's that your heart is not in the right place. You're doing it just to follow a set of rules and regulations. But who wants to love a programmed robot? He's saying, love. Love. This praying for your enemies, it's going to take a whole lot of love to pray for some of these enemies that you have, is it not? This love, church, I'm telling you, love changes things. Not lust, not infatuation, but genuine, authentic love. Because love will go the extra mile. Love will be kind instead of turn to anger. Love will see through commitment. Do you have this love? Do you have this type of love that you can share with the world? This love 
that you can love somebody despite their ignorance because that's what God did for us. God loves us despite our ignorance. Is this not what John 3, 16 teaches us? For God so loved the world. Me. Me. For God so loved you. For God so loved us, the world, so much that he gave us his son. God loved us despite our ignorance, despite our faults and our failures. You ask my wife and she said, she's going to tell you, I love him and all his mess. My flaws, because they are many. They're many. And they keep on being many. And the older I get, the more flaws I realize that I've got. This love. This love. Love. And with this love, so many things are addressing us. See, God didn't send His Son because He felt sorry for us. God sent His Son because He loves us. For God so loved the world. So loved. He was so moved. He so loves you. He don't feel sorry for you. He loves you. He loves you. Have you ever, have you ever gotten in the doghouse or maybe done somebody wrong and, and you give them something? You give them something and to try to make up for it. I remember I did this one time with the man and she got upset and so I got her flowers. She's like, why'd you get me that? I'm mad at you. That, like, you just wasted money there. It didn't do any good whatsoever because it wasn't out of love. It was out of guilt. It was guilt. It was guilt flowers. It was a guilt gift. And she caught me on it. And she didn't fall for it at all. And I think I've only bought flowers for her one or two other times. She's like, oh yeah, that's nice. Let's set them over here. She likes blueberries. I learned. Whether it's blueberries, whether it's flowers, whether it's chocolate, it's the heart behind it. And that is what Jesus was addressing here. The heart behind it. That was the problem. It was the heart behind marriage. The heart behind their anger. It wasn't that they didn't kill nobody. It was their heart behind it. They had a heart problem. And Jesus came to fix his heart problem because the problem that Jesus had in addressing his culture is the same problem we have in our culture. Sin. It's all sin. So what do we do? What do we do with this? What do we do with the world? What do we do with our family that seems that they're not worthy of our love? They're not worthy of our affection. They're not worthy of our prayers. What do we do? I think Peter put it best in 1 Peter 4.8. Church, if you don't leave anything here today, I want you to leave with this. 1 Peter 4, 8. He says, Above all, maintain an intense love for each other since love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. A multitude. Love it covers that. It's so good. And if you've never experienced it, it is so good. And the only way that I can compare it to because I know what some of us think, that we just can't do it. So I got some coffee here. We got some, I know we got some coffee drinkers, and you may not like coffee because you can compare this to anything else. I like coffee. And my sister's the one who, she got me started on this. I used to be just a regular Folgers or the, whatever was the cheapest. It didn't matter. And it was just, you know, what we call, like, you know, good coffee. Now, my brother-in-law, Tony, he loves it. He just wants to go over and get a can of coffee, whatever it is, He's good with that. That's all he needs. He doesn't need all these fancy flavors, nothing. Just good black coffee. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But my sister introduced me to this. And I'm like, oh, I, I, I like that. So then what she did, she raised the bar for me. And then I tasted it. I was like, I like this. This is really good. Go to put on, on sale. Why not? And so I started drinking this, this particular type of coffee. And it was great, and it was really good. So it kind of raised the bar, and I experienced it. And I was like, man, there was nothing like it. Until I ordered something uh, back in uh, Black Friday, and I got a complimentary bag of Black Rifle coffee. And I don't know if you've ever experienced Black Rifle coffee or not. But I, I tasted this coffee. And I'm not a spokesperson. I get no money for this, I promise you. I have a point. First of all, it's Black Rifle Coffee. Anything that has a reference to a gun, it's got to be somewhat good. But Black Rifle Coffee. And I, so I tried this, and I'm like, this is awesome. And so what was so funny, I had, I had this. Me and my wife, we drank it all within a week. And I was so disappointed. 
I was like, man, we, it, was, it was all gone. I was telling everybody, have you ever tried, have you ever heard of this coffee? It was so good. Like, it was so smooth. And my wife, she called me. She's like, what is this coffee you got? I went, it's black rifle coffee. She said, I don't even like coffee and it's good. I went, I know, it's so great. So this bar just kept getting set. But then we ran out of it. We ran out of it. And I remember telling my brother, I gave him one of my last cups of it. And I said, John, you've got to try this coffee. I'll make you some tomorrow. Are you going to be home? He went, yeah, I'll be home. So I made you some coffee. And I took it up to him. And I said, call me later. He never called. So I called him and said, how was the coffee? He went, hey, it was pretty good. I went, pretty good. And he went, it was awesome. Like, it was so good. But what I didn't know is that he had already bought me two bags for Christmas. And he was trying to play it down. And I was like, win. It was so good. But what the bar went, the bar just kept getting raised. And I'm sure there's other coffee out there that's better than Black Rifle Coffee. But if you come to my house, I'm going to offer you a cup of Black Rifle Coffee. And I've had some people that go, oh, man, that's, that's really good. And some people are like, man, I got me some Black Rifle Coffee. I got me some Black Rifle Coffee. I would know it's really good. Because here's the whole point. Once you experience it, that bar got set. It's like the rest of the coffee, like I can drink it, but it's just like, it ain't black rifle, but I'll drink it. Once you've experienced that love of God, once you experience loving people the way that God intended us to love them, once you experience this type of love, church, there's nothing like it. And I'm comparing that to coffee. And maybe you don't like coffee, or maybe you compare that to tea, your favorite soft drink, Fix your favorite way from your favorite restaurant, whatever that is, your favorite steak, whatever that is. Just whenever you experience that type of love, whenever you experience that love that God had intended for us to get, and I think this is the type of love that Peter was referring to because Peter experienced this love. Do you remember when he denied Jesus three times? He denied him. I don't even know the man. The last time he even cursed, I told you I don't know that man. But then when Jesus rose from the dead, Peter and his buddies went fishing. And all night, they were fishing out there with their nets. They caught nothing. And that morning, Jesus was on the shore. Hey, guys, you got any meat? He's like, no, we don't. He said, hey, cast it on to the other side. So they cast on the other side, and they caught a, just a whole abundance of fish. And the Peter went, that's Jesus. Put his coat off, jumped in the water, and swam all the way to Jesus. And it was there during this conversation that Jesus asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? He went, yes, Lord, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Go feed my sheep. Go love the world. Go tell them about me. Church, this is this love. This type of love. Did Peter deserve that forgiveness? It didn't matter. He experienced it. And sometimes this is what we're at. We don't, we don't deserve the grace that we get. We don't deserve the forgiveness, but he gave it to us. God so loved the world, for God so loved. And you put your blank in there. You put your name in there. For God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Church, this is a type of love. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, maintain an intense love for each other. An intense. What kind of love do you think that is? Well, I'm going to compare it now to, back to my Black Rifle Coffee. Because I've shared this with I don't know how many people. And I'm telling them about Black Rifle Coffee and I've took some to work and I've given some to other people. And I'm like, man, it's so good. I'm sharing it. I'm sharing it. And if you want some, we've got a cure here. I'll make you some too. But it's good and I, I will share it and share it. This is this love. This intense love, I think, is that we share it. And I don't think we get to be pickers and choosers about who we get to share it with. Because God sent His Son for the whole world. Who deserves this love? whole world church what jesus was addressing here was not necessarily these exact subjects he was addressing because they had a heart problem on these subjects they needed this love church i'm going to sum all this message down into this one statement looked at two different ways first do you have this love have you experienced this love this life-changing intense love have you experienced that church if you have there ain't nothing like it they ain't nothing like experiencing the love of God. Have you experienced that? Church is life changing. A few weeks ago, we had baptisms right here. When these people come out of the water, you could just see this all over them. This love of God, this presence. And it's awesome. And all you've got to do, you taste it, and I'm telling you, there ain't nothing like it. Do you have this love? See, I think some of us, we've, we've experienced this love. 
But we've been in the game for so long, it's almost like we've, for, we've forgotten it. We've forgotten it. You know, almost like it, it gets old. We need something new. This is what we do to cars. This, this is what we do to cars. We buy a brand new car or a slightly used car. And, oh man, we love it. We make sure we keep it clean. Get all the trash out every single time. But you keep that baby about a year or maybe two. It is like, ah, I'll clean it up tomorrow. It'll be all right. You go to write that payment. Instead of grinning, you're like, oh. You don't have the same affection for it. You, it, it it's, not, it's not there. And I think sometimes this is where we're at with, with our relationship with God. And I think it's because we've allowed sin to come in. It's empowering our judgment. It's empowering our love. And what Jesus was doing is the same thing to these guys. Hey, man, you're living down here. Yeah, you may be going through the motions. You may be able to have a checklist. You've not killed nobody. Check. You've not committed adultery. Check. You've not committed any type of sexual immorality. Check. But he says, I'm getting to the heart of the problem. I'm raising the bar here. And church, could you imagine what this would do? That if we would live by these standards, that we would love this type of love? What Peter was talking about in 1 Peter 4, 8, that we would love this intense love? So two things that kind of bring this around to is, do you have the love? And who do you need to love? Who do you need to show some love to? Who in your life do you need to show some love to? And I'm not talking about a romantical type of love. I'm talking about a prayerful type of love. This intense love that maybe somebody's done you wrong and they need some love. Maybe somebody that you just don't quite jive with. See, it's easy to love somebody that's easy to get along with. But man, you got somebody that's brash, somebody that rubs you the wrong way. You're like, oh man, I don't know about this. It, it just don't feel so good. But what Peter was addressing here is, man, this intense love, this intense love, oh man, maintain this because love covers a multitude of sins. Church, this world needs Jesus. And how are they going to see it? The way we love one another. That's what Jesus said about how we can recognize each other because we love the brethren. We love each other. We love each other. Do we love each other? Do we love? Or are we picky with our love? I'm picky with it. And again, the only way I can compare it to is with, with my coffee because I really like this. Go get your own coffee. See, I think this is what we do with our love. Go get your own. You want coffee? Fix it yourself. You can have this. This is mine. Is this what we do with our love? Are we stingy with it? I mean, or do we share it? This intense love. Church, that's what we need. The world needs Jesus. So I'm asking you the same question in two different ways. Do you have the love and who do you need the love? Because I think there's people in our life that, that maybe that it's kind of hard to love or maybe we almost thought they don't deserve our love or our forgiveness. But Jesus is saying, love. Peter says, this intense love that covers a multitude of sins. This world needs this love. It needs to be shared. But we can't share what we don't have. So you can talk up a good game and you can tell everybody else, hey man, have you tried Black Rifle Coffee? Our pastor loves it. It's great. He's got these other people on it. It's great. Yeah, well, let me have some. Oh, I ain't got none. I'm just telling you, you need to go get you some. It don't work that way. You can't give somebody what you ain't got. I got Black Rifle Coffee. You want some, we'll make some after church. But if you ain't got it, you can't share it. And this is why it's so important. Do you have the love? Do you have this love of God? Do you have this type of love? This love that covers a multitude of sin. This love of God. Do you have this? Or are you going through life thinking everybody else is out to get you? Everything's against you. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares. Because this world needs this love. Do you have the love? And who do you need to love? I think we're going to fall into one of these two categories. You may be here today and say, you know what, I don't know if I had that love or not. Church, it's time to nail that down. I'm going to sum up with this last verse. This is not in your notes. I encourage you to remember this, highlight it, write it down. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. And I'm going to read this here out of my King James. He says this. Be ye therefore perfect, 
even as your Father which is in heaven, perfect. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. <laughs> Jesus closes this message on raising the bar up by saying, be perfect. The bar's raised up here. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. And if we're not careful, we'll walk out of here today thinking, I can't do it. I can't live it. And this is why I think Peter, what he says is so important because this love, this intense love, this, this is how we reach it. This is not determining whether or not you're saved or lost. This is not determining whether or not that you're going to re obtain more from God or earthly blessings or anything like that. This is to have a closer walk with God. Because sin... It'll creep in. It'll destroy you. It'll separate this love. It'll separate this intense love. What Jesus is looking for is people who love one another. Would you take a moment and pray with me? Oh, Father God, we love you and thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for being so relevant to us today. And we ask God right now that you would just have free reign in here. Holy Spirit, may you just move about this room from heart to heart. Reveal to us, Father, the condition of our heart and what we need to do. What we need to do, Father, with the message that you have spoken to us today. Speak, Lord, for your servants. We are listening. As you continue to pray, do you have the love? If your answer is yes, you've got this love of God, would you take a moment and say, God, thank you so much for loving me despite my faults, my failures. Thank you, God, for loving me despite my sins my past. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Just take a moment and thank God. If you don't have this love, I encourage you to take the time to let's nail that down. Let's nail that down. If you don't have that love, I'm going to ask you if you would, you just come forward up here and let's just talk for a minute. I'll turn my mic off. Let's talk. You want to nail this down? Let's talk a moment. If you don't have this love, right now, Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. I'm going to ask you if you would. If that's you, you don't have this type of love. Would you just meet me right here and let's just talk a moment. Let's just talk. Maybe you're here today and everything's great between you and God. It's this love part with other people that you're struggling with. You don't have a problem with God, but you have a problem with other people. We ask the question, who, who needs some love? Who do you need to show some love to? Who is it in your life that needs love? You know who it is? Who is it you need to show some love to? This doesn't mean that you let them walk all over you. This doesn't mean that you just love them. You can start out by praying for them. It's what Jesus said about our enemies. We would pray for our enemies. Who is it you need to pray for this morning? That's a way that we can show our first act of love is that we can uplift these people in prayer. Who is it this morning that needs your time and your attention and your love through prayer? You got somebody? Maybe it could be your spouse. Maybe it could be your neighbor. Maybe it could be your parents or your children. Maybe your aunt or uncle. Maybe a coworker. Who is it this morning? That needs your love. And would you take the first step and pray for those people right now in prayer? Right now. Jesus says, hey, let's pray for our enemies. We're not going out to get them. We're not trying to get them back. We're going to up at these people in prayer. Right now, would you take a moment and lift them up in prayer? Who do you need to pray for? Just go ahead right now and take a moment. Talk to God and uplift Him in prayer. Whoever it is, who is it that needs your prayers? Who is it that needs your love? Pray for them. Maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a fiance, maybe a good friend who's struggling. Maybe a marriage you know that's struggling. Maybe somebody's done you wrong in the past and you need to let that go. Take a moment and pray for them. Who is it that needs your love this morning? Pray for them. Pray for them.
Father God, we love you, and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for it being relevant to our lives. We thank you, Father, for it being so clear. And Jesus, not only did he fulfill the law, that was his purpose. He raised us up. He was bringing to light that all this was a heart problem. We come down to love. Help us, Father, as we go throughout this week that we can love the unlovable. Maybe people have done us wrong, people that don't deserve our attention. Maybe we think that don't deserve our forgiveness. I pray, God, that you would help us today. That we may be able to follow after you in your pursuit for us. And that together, Father, we can show this world Jesus, this type of love. Same love that he had for Peter. Same love that God has for the world when he says that he sent his son to die. For us. Father, today we have lived anybody that's opposed to us our friends our family our enemies and God this morning you've already heard several names mentioned here today and I pray Father that these prayers are to go up God that you have prepared the hearts on the other end that they may be able to receive this love this affection from these people we try to show people the love of God we thank you Father again for your word and we thank you, Father, for speaking to us so clearly today. As we go into the world, Father, it's waiting on us. We have work waiting on us. We have family waiting on us. We have school waiting on us. Help us, God. That we not let the worries or the cares of this life to dim us down so much that we forget to love. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you take a moment give God some awesome praise? God, I love you. So, so.